Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to the Epstein Project podcast. I'm going to say that this is part two of my podcast of yesterday um, on the models, the uh, high fashion models, uh, including Naomi Campbell, their connection to the Tommaso Booty um, fraud their connection, and, and really, it, it was a, it was sort of like a fraud, you know, these models were said to be opening this restaurant, and that they were the owners, uh, but in reality, they were just, they were not the owners, they were a false front for Tommaso Booty and his brother. It was called the Fashion Cafe. Hey, before I get into this, please hit the like button, okay? Um, it was called the Fashion, the Fashion Cafe, and um, it was really just a, a fraud. Um, it they kind of uh, closed their doors pretty quickly, but they first, um, you know, opened up like one in London, I believe another one in Chicago. Uh, they were getting tons of investors lying to them. They were hit with um, tax liens. They didn't pay their rent. I mean, it was like literally, they just went in there uh, to scam everyone. Finally, they were hit with a 51 count indictment of using investors' money for personal expenses, uh, falsely claiming they had invested millions of dollars of their own money, um, wire fraud, stolen property, money laundering, you know, just you name it. They, they were charged with everything. And when this happened, uh, Booty, who married a Victoria's Secret model and his brother fled the country. So they became, um, fugitives in Italy. Um, one of the brothers, um, was arrested. So, um, Tommaso Booty was arrested in Italy. He was able to sort of get out uh, finagling and um, he became a fugitive. Uh, for 20 years, he could not come to New York uh, until Donald Trump, one day before, uh, well, on his last day of office, issued a slew of pardons. I believe it was over a hundred of them. And Michael Milken was one of them, and Tommaso Booty was another. Now, I, I mentioned yesterday, I'll mention it again in the event some of you missed it, that Donald Trump uh, told people he was a wonderful guy. He kind of uses that phrase for a lot of people, that he was a wonderful guy. And in fact, he selected Booty to run his... Um, modeling agency. Now, I want to talk about the models. So in my book, Glenn Maxwell, An Unauthorized Biography, I devote a whole chapter to Karen Mulder. She was also a part of this group. What they have in common is really fascinating. They all modeled for Victoria's Secret, which has all of you who listen to me or who follow me on Twitter and who read my books, you know that it's a company owned by Leslie Wexner. Leslie Wexner is the man who is pretty much from where I sit and having done the research that I've done, created the illusion that became known as Jeffrey Epstein. So he made him look like a billionaire, but he was no such thing. He bought for him many properties, including the largest mansion in New York City, 9 East 71st Street. Many of you have uh, been exposed to that property and the things that happened there. Um, he gave him his 727 uh, airplane, which became known as the Lolita Express. He pretty much propped him up uh, for, for many, many years and made him look like someone that he was not. Um, together, these men 
did um, some work uh, for intelligence agencies. You will see that in Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy. Now, these books are available on my website. They're available on Amazon. Um, and I really urge you because mainstream media is not going to tell you the story uh, in the way that I believe it should be told. Um, so the best that I can do, and I think it's shocking, um, one of my followers who is MK Ultra Girl, it's, I'm so uh, honored to be followed by her, um, she said yesterday in a tweet that it's the victims that are telling the story and that are doing the research. And it had not hit me until I read her tweet. How profound and how upsetting and how shocking and how true that is. Um, we have Virginia Giuffre, who pretty much single-handedly has taken down Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, when she took her to court uh, for the defamation lawsuit in 2015, which was settled in 2017. Um, she took down Jean-Luc Brunel, who is currently sitting in a jail in, in Paris. However, he has been trying very, very hard to get released from jail. Um, she has been relentless in her pursuit of justice. Now, justice is what I want to talk about because a lot of you are shocked. Um, one of my followers, in, in fact, it's not the first time I hear it, but it is sort of jarring for people who are outside of this world. Now, for me, I was a sex slave to one of these very powerful men. I was, um, you know, I've had... I thought I had three attempts on my life. It turns out it was four and, and four that I know of because, you know, maybe there was more and I didn't know. But one of them, um, I called the police two times, the police in New York City by dialing 911 when the intruder was trying to come in through my bedroom window. Now, what he had done was he climbed over the top of the roof and he climbed down the wall to my bedroom window he landed on my air conditioner and he did this several times because I would try to run to the front door to try to escape and then he would climb back up over the um, whatever that's called that you know there's a little short wall on the roof of the apartment building and then he would end up being in front in my front door. So this guy was very fit. Um, the more I think about it and the more that time goes by, it's pretty clear that he was um, trained, you know, that he was sort of like a soldier because you can't be climbing up the walls and doing what he was doing if you're just a normal person. And the way um, he came into my life was also sort of a setup. I thought he was homeless. I gave him a job to do. He started hanging around. In any event, this is in my memoir, The Billionaire's Woman. And, and so for me, looking at the models and how they got stuck in this world, and when I write about Karen Mulder, who in 2001, appeared on a television show in France, and the show, by the way, was never released. But at that point, she she told everyone, or she tried to tell everyone that she had been uh, turned into a sex slave, that she had been turned into a drug addict, that she was part of this um, uh, trafficking ring that serviced politicians and people in very high positions. And she even mentioned the police. So also on the local level, um, as you can see, I called the police two times and the police just basically told me I'm not coming. Uh, so to get back to Karen Mulder, um, she basically said on the same a television show 
that she was forced to go out with Prince Albert of Monaco. So at the time, uh, everyone made her look crazy. Everyone meaning mainstream media, her uh, fashion bosses and all of that. And that's the way it's always been. I mean, if, if you out one of these predators who are connected to an intelligence agency, such as my predator, such as Jeffrey Epstein, and in um, the case of Karen Mulder, the fashion industry, which is an, which is literally an arm of the intelligence agency. There is no way around it. I mean, they have been providing women uh, via catalogs in a very discreet way. Um, I will be talking about this a lot deeper in a separate uh, podcast, but for now, I just want to say that um, there was no, who, who do you who do you call? So you try to tell someone like Karen did in 2001, she was labeled crazy. She goes home after the show. The, the producers of the television show say, hey, we can't have this information uh, leave the studio. We can't have this information out, period. So they destroy the tape. They make sure that everybody that was in the audience, that nobody caught anything, and then they let them go home. She goes home. And what happens? There's a knock on her door. It's her sister. And she is put against her will into a mental hospital for five months where she is drugged and kept drugged for five months. Um, So again, who do you go to? There's nowhere to turn. If you have heard Maria Farmer talk about her experience being on Leslie Wexner's property in Ohio when Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell attempted to rape her, and and thank goodness they didn't, but they touched her inappropriately, and she was able to propel herself off the bed and go lock herself up in the bedroom and start calling everybody she knew in the phone book, but she also called the sheriff's office, and they told her, we're not going to come and help you, and and, um, so, you know, I believe that because that's the world that I've lived in. And whenever I've tried to go to an attorney, there's literally been no one who can help. Okay. This is the first time in history that normal people like yourselves and other people who have been in my position and or in the model's position and or in the position of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein um, and even the victims of Harvey Weinstein or victim of a very powerful person, whether you have been a child and it has been covered up. So for example, the church, which is again, it's like there's just this these layers of um, just abuse that have been ongoing for a very long time. They didn't just begin with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, but they are all interconnected. They're, you know, I hate to call it an octopus because it kind of, I'm using Danny Casolero's word, but it is an octopus. And Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell had, uh, is one arm of that octopus, which does connect into the modeling field. Um, so again, what happens uh, prior to the Epstein uh, Maxwell trafficking ring being exposed to the public? We had the Franklin scandal. Now the Franklin scandal was um, something that began in Nebraska in a place called Boys Town. It was initially a home for. Uh, boys who didn't have parents. They were supposed to be taking care of them. Later on, they started to accept girls. And not only were uh, was this boys town place being used by the local, uh, very wealthy uh, politicians and businessmen, uh, again, you know, very wealthy for their sexual 
uh, needs. So they were taking these children to parties, private parties, and also putting them on a plane and taking them to Washington, D.C., okay? This was happening during the Reagan administration. When the victims began to talk about it and somehow it got connected to law enforcement and they went before a judge and, well, they were basically told, if you do not recant your story and say that you were lying, we're going to put you in jail. So that is how bad it was. And if you go to Wikipedia and you look for the Franklin scandal, what will you see? And by the way, Wikipedia is the largest psychop anywhere because it is um, handled by intelligence agencies. There was a time when I had a Wikipedia page and that is gone. Uh, there was a reason I had a Wikipedia page because I was... I did a lot of work for Hurricane Katrina for three years, and all of that has disappeared. Um, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but if you go to Wikipedia, Franklin Scandal, you will see that it says, oh, this was a lie. This was an intentional lie. I, in fact, I'm going to try to find that page, and I'm going to see if I could read to you what it says about the Franklin scandal on Wikipedia. Just give me one second. Let's see, Wikipedia. Okay, it says the Franklin child prostitution ring allegations began in June 1988 in Omaha, Nebraska and attracted significant public and political interest until late 1990 when separate state and federal grand juries concluded that the allegations were unfounded and that the ring was a carefully crafted hoax. Well, one of those uh, victims, Alicia Owens, was put in jail. She spent, I believe, two years in solitary confinement and then continued to stay in jail. Um, so this is the first time in history that we are seeing the tip of the iceberg of this problem, this intelligence agency connected um, trafficking ring that includes minors of both sexes. And that has not even been discussed by mainstream media as it pertains to the Jeffrey Epstein, Glenn Maxwell case and adults. And it there's an arm where, where you know, the models are. So the models are caught between a, a rock and a hard place, aren't they, right? Because here they have been, in many cases, just like with some of Epstein's victims, and also it happened in the Franklin scandal and in other uh, trafficking cases where drugs are introduced. They, and initially they're introduced so that they could um, take advantage of the children and or the models. Um, and then, of course, they, the, they become hooked on drugs, which makes it easier for the people that are abusing them to keep them under their thumb. Everyone is expendable. Everyone is expendable. So... And there's no help. So the police are paid off. In my case, the police were paid off many times, many times. In fact, my abuser had the entire police department sort of almost on call to follow me wherever I went, um, to tell him where I was so that he can show up and sort of be there. And I suspect that his friend, Leon Black, um, is doing the same thing. I had done the same thing with um, Guzel Ganeva. Um, so it is frustrating. How do we get justice? How do we get justice? I mean, so tomorrow uh, is October 29th. What happens tomorrow? Prince Andrew finally answers the lawsuit that Virginia Giuffre has brought against him. She brought a lawsuit against him 
because she was in New York City, 17 years old. And in New York City, she was a minor. She was a trafficked minor. And according to uh, the court documents and her allegations, he, because of uh, Jeffrey Epstein and Galen Maxwell, you know, he had his way with her. So she is suing and uh, he's going to answer tomorrow. What do we know about what's happening tomorrow? We know that he is going to use Jeffrey Epstein's uh, agreement with Virginia to settle the lawsuit she brought against him years ago in 2009, where he paid her a certain amount of money, but basically said, okay, I'm paying you this amount of money, but you can't come after me again, and you can't come after my friends, my employees, or my business associates. So what is Prince Andrew going to do tomorrow? His attorneys tomorrow are going to present that because they have gotten from the court the permission to view the document, which was filed under seal. Now, what's interesting to me about um, the under seal thing is that Prince Andrew has told the court through his attorneys that they should keep Jeffrey Epstein's uh, agreement with Virginia Jeffrey under seal. That That's interesting to me, and I'll tell you why. Um, when someone dies, as is we all have been told that Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide on um, August the 10th of 2019, just a few weeks, a month and a half after his arrest, well, you kind of lose your rights. Uh, in fact, the lawsuit that was, not the lawsuit, but the action of the United States government against Jeffrey Epstein ended uh, when he died, as did, you know, any kind of, um, any kind of recourse for all of his victims. Um, all of his victims were basically told, well, you know, sorry, there's nothing we can do. He's dead. Go home. Sorry. You know, they let them show up in court one day and basically say something. And a few of them did. But um, the fact that Prince Andrew wants the document to remain under seal is interesting. And I want, I want to say, you know, let's, let's pin that. Let's, let's mark that because um, who is he trying to protect? If he's not protecting Jeffrey Epstein, he's protecting someone else. So who is he protecting? He's protecting perhaps someone above Jeffrey Epstein. And I've already said that Leslie Wexner was above Jeffrey Epstein. Well, who's above Leslie Wexner? In my opinion, it is the state of Israel and the CIA. So anyway, I don't want to get too um, far into this topic. I think I covered the fact that the models have also been victims, have been sort of kept in this trap, have probably uh, had to marry people they didn't want to marry, in all likelihood have also had to um, be intimate with people they did not want to be intimate with, have basically been part of the same octopus that uh, connects the Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell ring, and that goes back and connects to Franklin Scandal, and that connects to other uh, rings, like if you remember the Finders, um, which was closed after five days by the CIA, and nobody ever heard about it again. It was considered, oh, this is an internal investigation. So please leave your questions below. Like the video, subscribe. It's Kirby Summers for the Epstein Project podcast. Until next time. Bye.